Tide Talk with Webb is back, baby. Sorry, I've been on a little hiatus from everything been going on, but I'm back. Gonna have a little bit longer show today. Uh, we had a little story about uh, several players who were just getting uh, a lot of pra- recognition and praise from Alabama uh, in the spring and the fall for the uh, workouts and everything they are doing. These guys could probably contribute a lot this year. Uh, Deontay Brown was one of them. Uh, his biggest problem when he arrived at Alabama, he was 350, so he needed to lose a little bit of weight. But they said he's been doing great things, and he's absolutely a hoss as a blocker. Another guy, uh, Decatur native, uh, Vendarius Cowan, uh, he's 6'4", 240. They said this guy's a freak. He can play inside or outside linebacker. Absolutely amazing. Watch out for this kid. Uh, another guy is uh, Kendrick James. Uh, very, very high potential on this guy. He's a three-star, but they say he's way outperforming his star ranking and was not probably evaluated correctly on all these uh, different things that he was doing. Tremendous size, 6'6", 260. Great blocker. Um, they also said uh, Dylan Moses is amazing. Uh, 6'3", 235, they, uh, one of the fastest guys on uh, the team. He can play the run, he can play the pass, he can b- drop back and uh, pass coverage. They said the guy is just absolutely phenomenal. So he's making plays all over the field. Watch out for this guy. Another guy, Henry Ruggs. They said this guy's an amazing athlete. Uh, a little underhyped uh, coming into the year. They said that he's got elite quickness, great jumping ability, and is going to look to impress this fall. Another guy um, is Smith. Uh, He's going to be playing um, uh, wide receiver. They say this guy is way undervalued for what he's doing. And uh, he's the number nine wide receiver in the country, but they say he was very, very, very uh, undervalued. Another guy to be watching out for. I've been seeing so many stories on him. I've got another story at the end of this uh, podcast today. His name is Irv Smith. Uh, His father played in the NFL and was an All-American for Notre Dame. They say this guy is absolute professional from his classroom work ethic to his film study, studying extra film, extra time with quarterbacks. Uh, he runs a 4.59, and that's just in practice. So imagine what it is in uh, game speed, usually a little bit faster. So they say this guy is going to be an absolute standout. I saw a really cool story, guys. Uh, you know how Saban's always innovative, always looking for new technology and stuff. I uh, read a story about um, how they're tracking players, how they're tracking injuries. Um, it was really, 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 really amazing. Uh, let me flip to this page. It's um, this. It's like a GPS tracker, and it goes on the inside of your pads uh, for these practices. And it's been given Alabama a competitive edge. Uh, a lot of people say uh, that in the 2015, that the momentum swing in the national championship, we had the onside kick. But uh, a lot of people want to say that Kenyon Drake's 95-yard kickoff return for a TD was the big um, catalyst for that. But when he made his uh, end zone, as he made a mad dash to the end zone, there was a small, it's like a 3.8 inch device housed in the back of the running back shoulder pads, uh, captured the top speed. He actually ran 22.5 miles an hour. That's the fastest speed ever clocked for a Bama player, like is in history, as far as we know. And uh, they said, basically, how did he do this? Well, this system uh, is developed by Catap- uh, Catapult Sports out of Australia. Uh, it was launched in 06, and it takes a little bit of time to get, to get uh, traction. But this system is absolutely amazing. It works off a GPS system and a Russian uh, space-based satellite. It measured workload, acceleration, deceleration, directional changes, and explosive movements. And it clocks all this stuff and puts it into an Excel spreadsheet which is really cool. Uh, these tiny monitors help Alabama. They, what they do ultimately is structure practices, and they figure out, okay, well, this player's hurt. Um, he needs to have less practice or more reps or less reps, or he's not giving enough effort. It's totally, totally cool how they're using this. Uh, Alabama was one of only 55 universities that have partnered with Catapult to use this system. Excuse me. And also, it's an advanced uh, treatment of players who've been hurt and to prevent injuries from ever surfacing um, in the previous two years. Take all this data and all this different stuff. We began using it in Alabama in 2014. And uh, we were kind of unsure at at the first part of it. A guy named Clay Keith was very overwhelmed because he was put in charge of trying to collect the data and see what it meant. And uh, he went for months, I mean, days and days and days on end trying to figure all this stuff out. And he struggled. But uh, there was a guy named James uh, Hepner, if I'm saying that right, 
he's a senior uh, applied sports scientist from Australia. He helped break all this data down and, and, and kind of get a system for Alabama how to measure these stuff and then how to go from there. Uh, what's really cool, like I said, uh, what these uh, little pads do or GPS systems do for every player is these are the five different components it breaks down. It breaks down the total distance covered, maximum velocity, explosiveness in each direction, and yards run over 12 miles per hour and then the overall workload. So it measures all that stuff. What's really cool is they were talking about how that it safeguards against soft tissue injuries such as muscle pulls and spasms and stuff and knows how to hard and how, how hard to push a player and then when not to push a player. Uh, over time, you have baselines that are established for this stuff, and this is a really big key advancement in Alabama's uh, player development and also as well as bringing players back from injury and whatnot. It's really, it's really, 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 really cool how all this stuff works. Uh, and it copies like peak trends, spot trends, players' energy level, and it captures all of that. Um, <clears throat> Now Alabama currently has 44 shoulder pad devices used uh, by starters and immediate backups on both offense and defense uh, for this stuff. Uh, it's really cool because it collects them after each practice and each game. Um, and 20 to 30 minutes after every practice, this data is uploaded into a system, into a pre-formatted, like I said earlier, Excel spreadsheet, and is broken down by position group. Uh, Saban gets this the very next day. And in the morning, I assume sometime in the morning, and he, he scales back uh, repetitions for his key starters and reserves according to this data, whether he needs to push them harder, a little bit less, more game film and less practice time. Uh, it's really cool because we have a, a higher game uh, percentage every year now. We have 15 games if you hit the playoffs. So, you know, within two years, if you hit both playoffs and go to the national championship, that's 30 games. That's a lot of games on the body, which is really cool. And this article goes on to say that, uh, uh, Keith goes on to say, you've got to respect Coach Saban. He's a genius in his own right, and he's got a process down uh, to the way he wants guys to practice, to perform well. And this all goes into it as breaking technology on the cutting edge, and which probably give us, enough, us uh, some clear, defined edge. Uh, Cat Catapult also helps to, the Tide navigate long break uh, that precedes semifinal games to make them quicker turnaround for the championship game, which is really great. Um, like I said, for the rehabilitation process and the fitness level and the, everything that we're doing, even the fourth quarter program, uh, it helps to know when to scale back on the players because they're, they're you know, having issues, which is great. Um, it also helped, and this is a cool little example, it says for years it was believed that a high ankle sprain would sideline a player six to eight weeks, which usually it did in the past. It was born out of a little bit of a dogma and not much hard evidence to go on, uh, which is really cool. This system is breaking that down and saying that's nah, not totally true. Uh, performing uh, physically uh, injury, whether it was making a process toward the full recovery and the aftermath of it, was hard to gauge. Uh, the data that we're collecting on this stuff is showing clues to how uh, lower extremities, one versus the other side, and it's showing these baselines for these players so they know when they come back, when they're 80%, 90%, 100%. And so we're getting guys back on the field in a, in a relatively shorter amount of time than we did before. Uh, we used this system when Drake got hurt in 2014 against Ole Miss to get him back to what he was January 16th, uh, the next year for the national championship game, and how we brought him back so quickly, and how we could gauge all this stuff and how explosive he was, and the right angle versus the left angle with hurt and all that stuff. It was really, really cool how they tailored his program when he got hurt, and they're doing it for all these uh, first string and the, all the backups as well, which is absolutely amazing. Uh, some cool uh, NCAA, double, NCAA rules to note. Um, they're going to be changing, it looks like, well, they're in the talking process of it right now, changing uh, restrictions on transferring in the near future. You know how a lot of times the SEC was very strict on they're not going to let a player uh, leave Alabama and go to Georgia. They're like, nope, not happening. Well, they're looking at streamlining all of these uh, current rules and the way things are done so it's the same across the whole board in every conference, which is really, I think it's kind of cool in a way. And these stages, these ideas are just in the in the the, the planning stages right now. Uh, they were quoted as saying, um, uh, Justin uh, Sell, he's a working group on the chair of the NCAA committee. Uh, he goes, I'm thrilled uh, with the process that made this week, and I'm confident we can move forward with some initial concepts for consideration this year's legislative cycle. We're working towards academic-based data-driven decisions that benefit student athletes, teams, and the schools. Uh, under the current rules. Um, when you decide, before you decide to transfer, you have to get permission from the school 
uh, to tr your own school to transfer before you can talk about scholarships for the, the next school you want to transfer to. So, and it's very common right now for current coaches to restrict a player, even a graduate transfer, from going to a school that that school will play or could play in the future. Uh, you know, we saw that with Murray Smith with Alabama not going to Georgia and then Saban Relented, he went to Georgia. And also with Gus Malzahn and Antoine Jackson, he didn't want him to go to any SEC school, no Clemson, or he didn't want him to go to any school that would potentially play Auburn in 2017. Uh, but, you know, on the flip side, we also saw Georgia do that with A.J. Terman. Uh, they would refuse to let him go to any other SEC school or Miami, and so he had to wind up going to uh, Florida Atlantic to play. So some of this is going to be, I think, good for the kids. Uh, may not be good for your current school because you don't have to play the guy because you know he's probably pretty good. But we'll see how that goes back. So, you know, it's just getting feedback from uh, all these universities as well, trying to kind of see where it's going to go. I'm sure it'll go into effect next year at some time. So we'll just have to see. Um, and there's a lack of uniformity a lot of times in all these rules that people are looking at that have people kind of wondering, you know, maybe we should be streamlined to help the process. Um, some of the other things they're also looking at, I'm just going to read off this sheet real quick. Uh, institute uh, national transfer policy that allow individuals conference to adopt their own more restrictive uh, transfer rules. Have all transfers abide by the same rules regardless of sport. Have all transfers set out a year of competition at their new school or if they meet certain academic standards, allow them to play right away. Have um, graduate transfers count against the scholar school scholarship limit for two years, even if the transfer plays only one season. Apply APR standards to graduate transfers. Stiffen the penalties for coaches who recruit players to transfer from other schools. That's just some of the things that are on the docket, which is pretty cool. I'm sure that some of that will get picked up. Some won't. just depends. Uh, let's see here. Um, also, uh, a guy that I was telling you about, Irv Smith, I thought it was kind of cool. I looked up uh, this one story that tells about his background. His dad was a senior in 1993. Um, uh, he was a very, very good tight end at Notre Dame. He was picked out of a – he was just one of 11 tight ends since 1993 to be selected in the top 20 of the NFL draft. He comes from very good stock. Uh, Irv Smith Sr. Uh, Irv Smith Jr., He's going to be playing in Alabama. I suspect he's going to get a lot of playing time this year because he's consistent he is, and as well as he's been breaking out this spring uh, for Alabama. Like I said, he runs a 40-yard dash in 4.59. Um, like I said, he's 6'4 and 245. He's a big guy. He's a big body guy, but he's also fast. Uh, you know, so his dad is saying that everything he's seen his son do, he's really going by the book. He's going out and beyond what a lot of these freshmen are doing, a lot of these sophomores. He's really going out there and tackling this job. He wants the job. He's also doing very good things. Uh, he caught a touchdown against Alabama's first scrimmage. He leaped, uh, leaping grab in between uh, three members of the Tide secondary team and scored a TD. He later caught uh, three passes for 37 yards uh, during Alabama's spring, uh, spring game while working with the Tide second team offense, including a 34-yard catch and run uh, from freshman quarterback Tua Tugalevala, if I'm saying that right. A lot of people haven't heard a lot about him, but he's got a ton of talent. I don't think he was very uh, – he was uh, evaluated very well in the recruiting process. So I think that's what you're seeing. Uh, just some cool things um, from his dad, his career. His dad actually ran a little bit faster than him. He was a 4, 5, 6. And he played for – let's see who he played for. He played for New Orleans, San Francisco, 49ers, and Cleveland Browns. He, in his career, he caught 183 passes for 1,700 yards and 15 TDs. So he comes from very good stock, so look for very big things from that young man. Anyways, I'll have some more videos coming up this weekend and over the next few days. But anyway, Todd Talk with Webb. I'm out, baby!